Well, there are big video stores everywhere, aren't there? Every time you turn around. I haven't been up here in a long time. Yesterday you told me you didn't have any television. Yeah, I don't, I don't want one. My neighbors offered me one a few years ago. I don't want one. It's, I just don't want one in the house. It's like that old joke, I don't know if you ever heard it, where the, these kids, they come from the Lower East Side in New York, where you don't have a bathroom in the house, you have a community toilet on each floor. And the kids, they go to school and they get jobs and they become successful. And they all have nice homes, families. And so they get together and they, they tell their mother, look, mom, we're all successful, we have money. We're gonna get you a nice, a nice little home all for yourself where you'll have all the conveniences, you'll have lots of light, it won't be like this and you'll have closets, and you'll have, a, you'll have a bathroom right inside the house. You won't have to go outside anymore, especially the cold mornings. You'll have a bathroom right in the house. She says, in the house? I wouldn't have one of those dirty things in my house. <laughs> That's how I feel about television. I don't want one of those things in my house. I might get a disease. Well, that's a funny thing. You know, you get these things in the mail, at least here in this country, about uh, no purchase necessary to enter the sweepstakes. So I send them all back. And one day this big package comes to the door. And I get it inside and I open it up and it says, congratulations, you were one of the first 50 to respond to the sweepstakes. I want a VCR, <laughs> brand new. I don't know, $400 VCR, and I don't have a television set. It was pretty funny. So I gave it to my wife. She has Now she has two VCRs. But I go over there. We watch videos sometimes. It's kind of, it's kind of fun. Because you can talk to the screen and everything. See, that's one of the things that used to be so great at Times Square, especially this one movie. It used to be called the Laugh Movie. They would play three... Um, maybe Charlie Chaplin or um, Buster Keaton, three kind of comic, short comic films. And then it became a kung fu um, theater. It's like all kung fu movies. And the audience really participated. They would yell back and forth to the screen. In the meantime, there'd be people walking up down the aisle selling selling joints you know marijuana selling cocaine and they're yelling at the scream it was really a wonderful experience but that's all gone too bad i like all kinds of movies i'm a real movie buff i like good ones bad ones i like shoot 'em ups i especially like shoot 'em ups because it's it's easy to lose yourself in a shoot 'em up You don't have to think, you don't get involved in your, in your mind. And a shoot 'em up can absorb all the wacky stuff that you're trying to run away from. When, when I was living back east before Times Square was de destroyed, when I was really upset, I'd go to um, 42nd Street and I'd see his mate, sometimes seven movies in one day. I'd go get some hot dogs, go see a double feature, come out, get some more hot dogs, go back, see another two movies. And I really love to shoot them up, especially the old, what they call film noir, B movies. Randolph Scott, oh, did I love Randolph Scott. Cowboys shoot, boom, 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 boom. I loved all that stuff. Just kind of got lost in all the activity and the action. And I, I still like that today. You see, I was raised on, on radio and sound effects. And one of the things I like about sound effects and the movies today, the sci-fi kind of things, are all those great sound effects in the movies. So I, but I also like good films too. When, when you see one, it's kind of nice. But that's such a rare thing that I see a hundred shoot 'em ups to one good film. That's kind of the ratio that you have here anyway.
Which director do you feel particularly close to? Well, feel close to, I'd have to say Marty Scorsese, of course. Feel close to, when I, when I saw Goodfellas, I, at the end of the movie, I had this real powerful feeling of nostalgia. I felt like I had just visited home. <laughs> But there are so many, John Huston has made so many good films. And there are other people, but unfortunately I forget a lot of their names. But those are some of the contemporary people that I, that I really enjoy very much. Have you ever been approached about writing screenplays? A few, I wrote one, 1975. Uh, um, television, ABC. It was, it was supposed to do a special on the Ten Commandments. And the funny thing is, this is when ABC was, was like the low, low man on the totem pole. They had the lowest ratings in television. And they took five of the commandments with an option on five. <laughs> One of the craziest stories I've ever heard in my life. I don't know, I guess if they, if the five went well, then they would make the other five, and then if that went well, they'd send Moses back for another five. I, I don't know what they had in mind. But they took the first five commandments, and it was supposed to make, fe not feature film, television, two hour movies. For television, not religious or historic, contemporary stories based on on the um, on the commandments, and I there was one that nobody wanted, which which was remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, and so I I got that. Stanley Kramer was producing it, and uh, so I wrote a script for it and I handed it in. He said to me, this is the most beautiful and wonderful script I have ever read that will not be done on television. He said, you wrote literature. <laughs> he said, we'll both go broke, you write literature for television. So it was, it was never done, but I, that was one of the greatest compliments I've ever received. And the woman that typed up the script for me when I went to pick it up, she was hugging me, so oh, this is so beautiful. I was crying when I was typing it. And then Stanley's secretary, when I went in, she was hugging me, said, oh, this is so beautiful. But I guess, you know, it gets just too good for television. <laughs> what, a, what a medium. <laughs> so funny, anyway, I did that. I rewrote a script for a guy called Soldier of Fortune. And then I wrote a script for uh, Ralph Bakshi called Looking for Lenny Berkowitz. Uh, nothing ever happened with him. Oh, I did write that one film for, the, for that fellow in, um, in Switzerland, and that, he did that. So, I guess that's all the films. How did you feel about finally making a movie out of Last Exit to Brooklyn? Oh, I liked the idea, and then I got involved with the whole project, and it was one of the great experiences of my life, because uh, Brent got me involved from the beginning, which was December of 86. We went to New York, looked at locations, and then I was involved, not in writing the screenplay, but every time they had a draft, they would ask me to go over it, make suggestions. And then when it came time to shoot the film, I was involved in that. I was on the set every day. And it was, a, it was really a fantastic experience. And part of it was, was watching these people come to life on the street, on the same streets that they were associated with, that they were born from, so to speak. And watching it all come to life like that was a powerful, really powerful experience. It was overwhelming sometimes. 
And I remember when when we shot the um, Harry Black's final scene, the crucifixion scene, and the next day we were watching the dailies. And when when they finished, the lights went on, and and Uli turned to me. Uli's the director, Uli Adel, and he said, "So, what do you think?" And it was just Uli, uh, Desmond, the screenwriter. Bernie, the producer, myself, and maybe Anna. There's only five or six of us left in the room. And I started to say something, and I just started crying and sobbing. It was just incredible. It was coming from some place so deep inside of me, I hadn't, I hadn't recognized it. And it just wouldn't stop. And I heard myself saying, oh, that poor son of a bitch. All he wanted was to be happy. So obviously I was moved very much by the making of the film and them putting these people to life. And I come to realize how much I really love these people. I never, I never experienced that with such force and power until I saw it actually in a living essence on the streets and then on the screen. So that maybe that was the most powerful aspect and experience for me of making the film last things it was to find out how much I loved those people that I had created. You see, by the time I saw the finished product on the screen, I had seen the shooting every day, seen the dailies every day. I looked at maybe a dozen rough cuts before they finally got the, the, um, the end product. So, I don't know that it wasn't like so much of an impact when I, when I finally saw it. But the whole experience of the premiere in Munich was really something else. So we had toured all over Europe doing the PR thing, and Bernie brought my mother along. And my mother has never been out of Brooklyn, and all of a sudden she's never been on a plane. And, that's, and let's see, that was. 10 years ago, she was 78 years old at the time, 79. So, and all of a sudden she's flying all over the world. We, you know, we went, we went first to Munich for the premiere and then we went to Paris and Rome and, and Scandinavia. And I can't remember everywhere we went, but she had a marvelous time. And Bernie rented the um, Olympic Stadium for the party after the premiere. <laughs> it was just a, an incredible experience for me and for her. So all of it together, oh, it was so much beyond just the film. Because after the, after the premiere, after the film in, um, in Munich, Bernie introduced, some of us got up on the stage and introduced how many of us were still in town, I don't know how, maybe a dozen of us. And when he called me up, he called me up last, and there were a couple of thousand people in the theater, they all stood and gave me a, a standing ovation, and I knew this thrilled my mother beyond anything, you know, to have this happening to her son, her only child. And I had given my mother a real hard time, not intentionally, but, I can be difficult to live with. Plus, I started to die when I was 18, and you know, and all that sort. So there's a lot of heartache for my mother connected with me, and this, I think, kind of, kind of made everything worthwhile for her. So, I mean, there's just so much to the experience that it goes beyond just the book and the people, and this, it's just everything. And there is this project about Requiem for a Dream. Yes, a fellow who just made an independent film called Pi. That's the mathematical formula, Pi. And he got the Director of the Year Award at Sundance Festival this year. And actually sold his film to a distributor. It's being distributed. He wants to do Requiem. And he's like the 
the new hottest thing in town. So there's a lot of people after him, telling him he can do whatever movie he wants, and this is what he wants to do. So he and I have been working on a script, and there's a good chance it'll, it'll be done. However, in, in, in this business, the film business, you you never know what what will be done, what won't be done. But at this stage, it does seem to be a good chance that Requiem for a Dream will become a film. The thing is, it's, it's very, very difficult, almost impossible to make a good movie out of a good book. That's one of the primary difficulties. But um, who knows, before I die, they may make movies of all of them. Can you imagine the room on screen? Oh, wow. <laughs> that is really something to behold. I don't know. Well, we'll see. <laughs>